Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs and to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10 this morning, verses 8 through 10. Before we read, I neglected one announcement. We have a, a member who faithfully reminds me when the last day for voter registration is so that I can inform you in case you forget. Uh, it is tomorrow is the last day for voter registration. And Nita Davidson uh, has those cards, so you know she tries to make it easy for everybody. Uh, and so she will be in the back, I think, at the end, if you need those. Uh, that's tomorrow's last day. So just to, to serve you in that way with a reminder. Let's read this marvelous section of Scripture together. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I have two friends, one of whom is uh, fairly administratively on top of detailed aspects of his car, and one of whom is not. And at one point, as I heard the story, these two friends were in a car together, and the on top of it friend noticed that the clock was significantly out of time. And when I heard this story, I cringed because my car clock is perpetually out of time, and you just learn to calculate the difference between what it says and the real time, uh, and you just learn to live there. You, you become very effective at math, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm, and this friend, his clock was, was woefully out of time, and in the course of their conversation, my administrative friend said, do you realize, you, would you like me to fix that? I, I can just fix that. It's, it's not actually that difficult to fix. And the person who's like me was somewhat perplexed, apparently, and said, can you do that? That would be, that would be great. That's, I can imagine my reaction. What, you mean like it's easy to do? <laughs> this is not like a permanent condition that it's, you know, 47 minutes behind the time? No, actually. And he immediately proceeded to quickly click, 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 click. There it is. It's, it's the right time now. And I wouldn't be surprised if that person subsequently was late many, many times because now his calculations are off. That would have been what would happen to me. Oh, I've got all kinds of time. No, it's actually on the right time now. Uh, on time and not on time, the clock tends to drift. And, and I don't know about your car. My car does that too. If for some reason, uh, it gets angry at me or something, and it drifts from the right time. It'll be right, and then it'll drift. It'll, it'll sort of drift away. I'm like, why, why? It was just right. Now it's three minutes off again. Like, why does it do this? I didn't, my battery's not dead. It just, it just seems to have this natural inclination to drift away from the right time, and I have to go and reset it again. Well, I think our hearts are like that when it comes to grace. We're supposed to set our hearts on grace and the grace of God, but they sort of drift away. And we don't always notice it. It's, it's like one day we, we get into our day, we realize, wow, my, my heart isn't set on grace at all. It's set to some other time. And normally it's some time called legalism or works or earning my way to God or condemnation or worry or anxiety. Somehow it drifted. I mean, I, I know where my heart's supposed to be, but it's drifted again somehow. And sometimes we just get used to living that way. 
We just function, well, that's just, you know, where I am. I just kind of live in this, this halfway between knowing where my heart should be and knowing where it is in relation to grace, and I just kind of live with the difference. I calculate the difference, and I kind of know where I am. I'm at just enough distance from grace that I understand that I'm not totally out of whack, but, but I'm not right on grace, and so I don't have quite the same confidence all the time. Our hearts drift from grace. They, they drift away. It's, it's imperceptible at times, but it's certain. It's gradual. I've never met a person whose heart clock didn't drift away from grace. I've never met a Christian whose heart clock didn't drift away from grace. And so I think what Paul is speaking to us is this, this delightful call, set your heart on grace. Set your heart on grace and reset it on grace and reset it again and check it to make sure it's set on grace. Set it on grace. You want your heart set on grace. Don't let it drift to something else, some other time. Set your heart on grace. This passage is just one of the gems of the book of Ephesians. There are many gems in Ephesians. It's really one of the gems of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, one commentator, Harold Honer, says this, verses 8 through 10 depict, listen to this, depict the essence of the gospel, probably the best summary in the Pauline corpus. It is grace from start to finish. Grace from start to finish. Finish. And if I had a prayer for our church and the effect of this book and this passage on our church and on my heart, it would be that that would be true of us, that our hearts would be set on grace from start to finish, that there would not be a drifting, a wandering, a gradual minute by minute progression away from the truth and the glory of grace, that our hearts would be set on the glory of grace. Let me urge you this morning, as we, as we benefit from this passage, set your heart on the glory of grace. Two points, breaking down Paul's uh, teaching here. First, resting in grace, and then revealing grace. Resting in grace and revealing grace. All, all, all ways in which, two ways in which we can set our heart on the glory of grace. First, resting in grace. Resting in grace is the description of the Christian's state. A Christian is one who rests. Their soul is resting in the arms of grace. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 8. There's the summary, you, marvelous gem sentence that we should all memorize. By grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So just some explanation here. Grace is is the favor of God towards those who should have been punished. The favor of God, the goodness of God, the favor, the, the, the kindness, the affection, all, all of God's benevolence, think of all those, those marvelous words of goodness, directed towards someone who should have been punished. So the, what we should have received is wrath and punishment. What we received was favor. And, and, and that situation is called grace. And you have been saved. You, you could translate that you are saved by grace. It has this idea of something God has done that has continuing benefits into eternity. It never, it never changes. That's the way that the grammar reads. You, you are saved. You, are, you have been saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. This salvation is never changing. It's always the same. And the basis of that is the undeserved favor of God. That's the basis. You've been saved by something, and the something is grace. And the, <laughs> the repetition that Paul goes through in this passage is part of the reason I think he is so convinced that every Christian drifts from grace. Our clock gets off. Because he is, I mean, he is so repetitious. I mean, so repetitious. He says the same thing. And we, we've gotten to know Paul. We know Paul. Paul can go on these long tangents, right? He starts over here, and all of a sudden he's got this wholly different idea over here, and now he's interrupted himself again. Not in this sentence. 
Not, not in this. Paul finds like nine different ways to say the exact same thing over and over and over and over again. He says it positive. He says it negative. He talks about the means of it. He says the same thing over and over and over again. Here, here's what I mean. By grace, you have been saved through faith. So he adds through faith because faith is the means. He, he wants, what Paul is doing is he is eliminating any other option than undeserved favor, favor as the basis of our salvation. That's what he's doing. So he says, you're saved by grace. That should be enough. But he adds, by faith, through faith. What that means is the means, what we did to receive this faith was simply to receive it. Faith is this odd word. To have faith in, in the New Testament scriptures is basically to receive something. It's to receive. It, it, it is an action, but it's an action of receiving. Faith is not a work. It's not uh, having faith as in exercising faith where I, I, I'm able to be strong in a certain way. I'm strong in faith, and therefore God gives me faith. No, the, it's one of these odd, interesting words. The stronger you are in faith, the more you are declaring, I have nothing to give. So the, the more you go towards faith, the less you go towards earning the, the, the more you are in your faith towards God, the less you are depending on yourself. So what, what he's saying is to, to be receiving grace through faith is to declare from a subjective stand, standpoint, I, I, this, the means of receiving this grace was only receiving it. There was no other method. There was no other way of getting grace except just to receive it from God, to say, yes, I will receive it. We're resting in grace. But that's difficult because our hearts crave credit. They fight for credit. They are uncomfortable with the absolute surrender of all confidence in ourselves. My heart's uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable with the absolute surrender of all confidence in ourselves. That's what Paul is saying here is the, the nature of the grace we're to set our heart on. Surrender all confidence in yourself. And he, he makes this explicitly clear. He keeps going again, the same repetition. Now he says it negatively. And this is not your own doing. You notice Paul's determination here? You're saved by grace. It's through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is not your own doing. And you know what? Let me say it again. It is the gift of God. It, it is a gift. It's not a wage. It's not a payment. It's a gift. You didn't pay for it. This is a gift. It, it's given freely, without cost, without price. And then he says it again. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, not a result of, I mean, how many times can he say this? You're saved by grace. It's through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. I mean, the man who has a meandering vocabulary style suddenly abruptly becomes machine gun rapid fire. He's so determined because he doesn't want us to drift from grace. Favor that's undeserved. Apparently we have this tendency because he gives us five different phrases. You're saved by grace. It's through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not by works. We must really need constant checkups in the area of whether we are resting in grace because our hearts crave credit. We are uncomfortable surrendering all the benefit of salvation to the kindness of God alone. I recently have enjoyed the arrival of my fourth child. And as you know, in the season when you have your children, you don't sleep very much because they don't sleep very much. And that's the normal way of doing things. And on a couple of occasions, please don't be impressed by this, a few occasions compared to the countless occasions my wife is up at night, I stayed up at night a few times to help her and to serve her. And 
in those moments, you're always sort of hoping that maybe miraculously this child will sleep at night rather than in the day. That's always your prayer because they don't do that. And, and so we have, a, there's a little bed in, in where he, his crib is. And so we would kind of lay him there on the bed, hoping and gently set him down. And then I would kind of lay close to him because we had to still kind of watch him a little bit and keep an eye on him. And, and I'm there and I would try to sleep. But if you've ever tried to sleep, kind of sideways on half a little tiny bed and and afraid you're either going to fall over this way or fall over this way. You kind of sleep, but when you wake up, you hurt, okay? Your body hurts, and there's something inside you that says, you're trying to cheat me, aren't you? (laughs) That doesn't count. I'm sorry. Nice try, but you may think that was two hours. That wasn't even close to two hours, okay? Because the whole time you're sort of holding yourself while you're resting. I'm, I'm sort of resting, but I'm kind of not resting. I think that's like Christians all the time. We're sort of resting, but we're sort of not. We're sort of laying down. I mean, yeah, I believe in grace. I believe in grace alone, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of holding myself up. I'm, I'm kind of making sure that I'm, I'm watching over this responsibility here and I'm not falling over here. I'm, I'm kind of still aware. I'm aware of this responsibility. I'm aware of this danger. That, that was like me on that bed. I'm aware of the baby and I'm aware of falling off the bed. I'm, I'm kind of aware of both of these things, and I'm kind of asleep, but I feel like I'm not really asleep. I'm, I'm sort of resting, but not really. And that's like Christians all the time. All the Christians, we live like that. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm resting in grace. We wouldn't deny grace. We wouldn't say we're supposed to work for our salvation, but we live in this sort of half asleep, half awake, half resting, half holding ourselves up kind of mentality. So we sin, and rather than seizing a moment to rest in grace completely, we add a little bit of resolution to do better. I do that all the time. I sin in some way, and I, I, I reference grace. I know I'm saved by grace, but I'm also going to be really working on this. And subtly, we sort of hold ourselves up a little bit in our thinking. Or we think about our past, and we remember things that we've done, and, and we, we sort of rest in, I'm, I'm glad there's grace, but we also let our minds drift to things we're doing now. I, I'm so glad I'm in a better place now. We look at our, our current state, our current godliness, our current love towards the neighbor that we once despised, and we think, well, I'm, I'm better now. I'm doing better now, and that way we sort of hold ourselves up just a little bit, not completely, Martin Luther, the theologian, said, to be convinced in our hearts that we have forgiveness of sins and peace with God by grace alone is the hardest thing because our hearts crave credit. I want to encourage you this morning. Think about your heart. Think about your days. Think about your week. Where is your heart drifting from Paul's absolute insistence? The favor you have with God is not based on yourself. It is not based on yourself. You have received it, but it is not based on yourself. It is not based on what you've done, what you are doing, what you will do, what you haven't done. It is not based on you. God has decided to give favor, grace towards you, and let Paul be very clear. This is through faith. You simply receive it. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, past, present, or future, so that, and here's the goal, here's the goal that we have to recognize our heart, no No one may boast. We have to appreciate that attempt to hold ourselves up comes from the pride that wants to boast in the end that we didn't need grace alone. And Paul is determined to devastate that pride. You will not, he says to his own heart and to my heart and to your heart, you will not boast because you have nothing to boast in. The only basis of your salvation is the undeserved favor of God. John Newton says, this is faith. 
a renouncing of everything we are apt to call our own and relying wholly upon the blood, righteousness, and intercession of Jesus. Grace is not a second or third chance. It is not. Grace is not a second chance. It is not a second chance to try again. It is not a third chance to try again. It is not a hundredth chance to try again. It is not infinite chances to try again. That is not what grace is. Grace is absolute, secure, unchanging, uncorruptible favor from God, not dependent now, ever, or the future on what you do. Grace is not a little help for making up for our moments of weakness. It's not as though there's an eight-foot wall and we can make it to six, but we need a boost. Grace is not a stepping stool. Grace is not something we earn if we're good enough. Grace is the favor of God completely aside and even opposed, opposed to any work or merit on our part. We must become opposed to thinking of ourselves as earning favor with God. There's a marvelous little booklet called Honey Out of the Rock. It's an old, old little booklet, but it's full of gold. Honey Out of the Rock by Thomas Wilcox. It's a lengthy quote, but let me, let me, let, let's benefit from this wise man as he, he challenges us to take our heart to task and how we lean into trusting ourselves. He says, when we come to God, we must bring nothing but Christ with us. Any ingredients or any previous qualifications of our own will poison and corrupt faith. He that builds upon duties, graces, etc., knows not the merits of Christ. This makes believing so hard and so far above nature. If you believe, you must every day renounce as dung and dross your privileges, your obedience, your baptism, your sanctification, your duties, your graces, your tears, your meltings, your humblings, and nothing but Christ must be held up. Every day your workings and your self-sufficiency must be destroyed. He doesn't mean you you need this to be saved every day. That's exactly his point. You need this because your heart drifts every day and wants to claim credit. Now, thankfully, God still gives grace to those who in their ongoing battle still fight for credit because we need constant reminder. We claimed Christ to the degree that we could, but our pride still lingers back there at times and, and wants to drift back. And thankfully, God forgives us even of that. Even of that, even of those little moments of self-righteousness and patterns where we're, we're looking to ourselves again and, and grace is underneath all of that. And so Wilcox is saying, every day, work at setting your heart back on grace. You're not working on setting God's grace back on you. You're working on setting your heart back on grace. Every day, your workings and your self-sufficiency must be destroyed. You must take all all out of God's hand. Christ is the gift of God. Faith is the gift of God. Pardon is a free gift. Ah, how nature storms, he says. Oh, how descriptive he is. How nature storms, frets, rages at this, that all is of gift and it can purchase nothing with its acting and tears and duties, that all workings are excluded and of no value in heaven. Resting in grace. Resting in grace is what Paul's words encourage us to do, to describe ourselves as resting in grace. Ask yourself these questions. Are you resting in grace? Are you setting your heart on grace in such a way that you're resting in grace? Not holding yourself part way, sort of laying down on grace, but fully resting. My favor with God is based totally and completely on His favor towards me and the work of Christ on the cross and has nothing to do with my past, present, or future. Picture yourself on that that horizontal, the the bed of grace. What do you look like? One foot off, one foot on, hanging, holding, I mean, or are you resting? 
What does your soul look like? Is your heart set on grace? Or is it sort of a half on, half off situation most of the time? Don't, don't let it be. Set your heart on grace. What my heart does is it produces this false guilt. This, this can't be right. This can't be right. Surely I should feel, maybe the feeling of guilt is half the gospel. If I cling to a feeling of guilt long enough and I believe in God's grace and you put those together, that's the perfect combination gospel. I've done that. I had a season when I, I was doing my, my devotions that I do with the Lord and, and I just had convinced in my mind somehow that before I could read the Bible, I needed to confess the sins I was aware of from the preceding day. Now, nothing wrong with that practice. That's a good practice to do. But for me, in that moment, I felt like I couldn't read my Bible or approach God unless I had listed out my sins and my failures and often repeated confession. Lord, please forgive me. And that doesn't seem quite good enough. Let me say it again. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, I, I, please forgive me. And eventually I would notice my heart begin to get calm again. And then I could read the Bible. And at some point, God began to convict me. Your confessions are becoming your gospel. Nothing wrong with confessions. But, but I think you've turned them into a work. And your heart is set on them. So I, I just made a practice of it. I said, you know, it's actually the case that in Christ, I could approach the Bible even if I haven't gone back and listed through the sins of yesterday. I mean, I believe that theologically. So I, I put it to the test. Oh, it was agony. It was agony for me. I would open my Bible and I would start to read. It would just be guilty. You haven't gone through your list from yesterday. You haven't done this yet. You can't. Who are you to open up the Bible and start to read? And the, the foolishness of that would strike me. I'm reading the Bible. Like, this should be a good thing. But for me, it actually felt like sinning, like sinful presumption to read the Bible. But I was determined. No, no. I believe I am saved by grace alone, and I will not turn even my confessions into a gospel to save me. And so, in order to shape my heart and set my heart on grace, I'm reading this Bible, and I'll confess after I've read the Bible. And for me, that was this huge setting my heart on grace moment because my heart battled and it took days and days before I could even really enjoy reading because I was just guilty and I'm, I'm forcing my eyes to go down the words and to pray and think, oh, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this. Yes, I should. The thing that's telling me it's wrong is the same pride that wants credit and salvation. But Paul says, no one may boast. No one may boast. Leave behind, says Wilcox, every day your workings and your self-sufficiency. Take all at God's hand. Let me give you a couple categories. Of this, this category of resting in grace. In the morning, abandon yourself to the truth about grace. Let me encourage you to do that in the morning, right when you get up. My mornings are filled with intentions that make me feel better about my day. They should be filled with declarations that grace alone gives me the favor of God today. Let me encourage you to start your day setting your heart on grace. Set your heart on grace at the beginning of the day. When your alarm goes off, set your heart on grace. As you have your breakfast, set your heart on grace. Just tell yourself the truth of this. By grace, I have been saved through faith. This is not my own doing. It is the gift of God. I have received a gift of salvation. Favor, undeserved, undeservable, has been given to me. Set your heart on grace in the morning. Another category. In moments when you're convicted, set your heart on grace. We should experience conviction in the presence of God. We don't work out and grow in our sins so that we can draw near God. 
We draw near God because of Christ and grace, and there in his presence we are humbled and broken by our sin and renewed and pressed forward into godliness. So let me just picture this spatially, okay? Sometimes spatially we think, I'm sort of outside of God's presence and I'm working on this sin. I'm I'm figuring it out. I'm trying to grow in it. I'm making some progress. And then when I reach a certain point, then I can approach God again. No. No. That's not what the Bible instructs us to do. The Bible instructs sinners to draw near. Sinners draw near. Sinners who are currently battling their sin, draw near. Whether you're not saved yet, you need to draw near for the first time in your sin. Don't fix yourself and then draw near to God. Draw near to God so he can fix you, so he can save you. And if you're a Christian, do it the same way. Approach God in the midst of your conviction, not after your conviction has been fixed by a a sense of intention and growing. Approach God in the midst of your failure, in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of my conviction, in the midst of not even being, having my sin under control yet. Approach God right then. I am a mess of sin right now and I'm approaching you. And then let God begin to do work in your heart. So in moments of conviction, set your heart on grace. Set your heart on grace. In moments of prayer and worship, I I would just encourage a practice. This is a habit I've tried to cultivate. When you pray, I would encourage you, if you can, the first sentences of your prayer, make them some reminder of grace. It's not a law. I mean, it's not bad if you don't do that, but it's a, I think it's a good habit. Make them some reminder of grace. I think that's in effect what Jesus was doing when he he told his followers to begin by saying, our father. It was a gospel reminder. So I would encourage you, when when I begin praying, oftentimes I'll say, Lord, thank you that I can come to you covered by the favor I haven't deserved. Thank you, Lord, that that I'm coming to you because of what Jesus did on the cross. Just little, it's just quick. Lord, thank you that we can approach you. It's just a way of setting my heart, because my heart, it drifts. And all of a sudden I look at it and think, "I'm, I'm not on grace right now. When, when you pray, I, I would, I, that's just a practice. You can ask Mark and Aaron. We pray together for the church, and, and, and often that's, that's a habit that I, I try to cultivate is just to start with grace. Lord, thank you. I can approach you because of grace right now. It, it's a good habit when, when we pray. Rest in grace. Set your heart on grace. What does that mean? It means to rest in grace. It means to rest in grace. Second point, reveal grace alone. So rest in grace alone, and then reveal grace alone. Verse 10 says, for, it's giving a cause again, for we are his workmanship. Verse 8 said, for by grace you have been saved. The goal would be that so that no one may boast. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. It's it's building on the same argument. And and he's giving another reason. The reason why it's not based on our own work is that we ourselves have been created by God. The the reason that, that (laughs) in Paul's mind, that would be like something saying that space created something. In Paul's mind, that's that's what it's like. This, This nothing did something. He's saying, that's impossible. It's impossible for it to be by works. You know why? Because God created something that wasn't there before. How could a nothing create something? Is the logic of Paul. He's saying, why why is it not based on our works? Well, well, and you notice the, the play on this theme here. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So there's good works to be done certainly, but these good works reveal the grace of making us new in Christ. They reveal that. They, they are the result or the goal of what God has done. The initiating work was not ours. It was God's for. Why, why, why is it not a result of works, Paul? Why can't anyone boast? Well, because God made you out of nothing. In Christ, in the sphere of activity that is Christ Jesus, he made you. He recreated you. You were dead. You were nothing spiritually, and he made you alive. How could anything a nothing dead thing has done be counted worthy of salvation? Paul's logic is impenetrable. It it, it can't. A nothing deserves nothing. So why is it by 
grace alone, well, we're his workmanship. He created us, a new us in Christ. The you that is the godly part that actually does do good works now is something that didn't exist before God started it. That's what Paul's saying. Now, you notice Paul's wisdom because he's also aware of the potential of misunderstanding his, his claim that salvation is not by works to mean that we live perpetually in a passive state in every sense. And so he's, he's able to do both at the same time. He says, look, look, you're saved not by works. Why? Because God made you in Christ. And let me remind you, he made you to accomplish a specific purpose. You notice, look down at your Bibles. Look what it says. He made you his workmanship for a purpose, for good works. So yes, you, there's good works to be done, but they're the result of God's unaided and unmerited activity in creating you in Christ. You're created for good works. And lest you think those works lead to your credit, no, God prepared those works beforehand. So even the works themselves were prepared by God. Yes, we have to walk in them. So there's, there's no commendation here for the passive Christian. That's not what this is speaking of. When it comes to our salvation, we are completely passive. When it comes to our Christian life, yes, we do good works, but they reveal grace rather than produce grace. That's Paul's point. They reveal grace. They reveal the grace of God creating us. They reveal the grace that God prepared these works in advance. They reveal grace. Yes, we're supposed to reveal grace. We're supposed to walk in them. We don't sleep as Christians. We walk as Christians. But the walking is just proof of the power of God's regenerating grace. It reveals grace. It reveals God's grace because he prepared them, it says beforehand, that we should walk in them. So no, no commendation here for the passive Christian. I'm just trusting grace I'm sinning all the time, and all I do is trust God. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Well, that doesn't honor grace. That's not setting your heart on grace. The grace that saves is the grace that transforms. The grace that saves is the grace that makes dead people alive so that they act alive. But the credit for all of that goes to God. Rest in grace and reveal grace. You don't, listen to this and apply it to your typical battle towards obedience. You do not have to drum up a desire for obedience that does not exist in your heart. If you're a Christian, you already want to obey God. If you've never wanted to obey God and you can't imagine wanting to obey God and everything you do is exclusively out of duty and you think you have to do it, I would challenge you to consider, are you a Christian? Or are you just a nice moral person who's trying to be better than your neighbor? That that could be. And if that's so, let me encourage you to begin where Paul begins, rest in grace. Rest in grace. As you rest in grace, you're going to experience something that's going to happen in your heart. As you turn to Jesus for salvation and cast all of your sins on him and declare you can't work your way to heaven, all of a sudden you're going to notice a heart change begins to happen. A heart change. And all of a sudden you'll notice, I I want to obey. I also want to disobey. So I'm in a bit of a battle here, but I do want to obey. I want to glorify God. If you're a Christian, you want to obey. Why? Because you're God's workmanship and God doesn't create Christians who don't want to obey. Why? Because it reveals his grace. It reveals it. God doesn't make broken Christians. Reveal grace alone. Reveal it. Don't earn it. Don't try to earn it, but reveal it. Reveal it. I I think that we spend far little time meditating and allowing the Spirit to amplify in us the reality that we want to honor God. We talk a lot about how difficult it is to obey and the challenges we have obeying and how many times we haven't obeyed, and that's not bad, but sometimes I think it would be good just giving voice to what do you want in your new self? Just saying it out loud. Do you want to obey God? Yes, I do. 
Yes, I do. Every Christian can say that naturally. Yes, I want to obey God. Do you want to live for God? Yes, I do. We, we tend to assume those kinds of things and talk a lot about how difficult it is and the ways we haven't. When I should, we should spend some time, even just with each other. Do you desire to obey God? Yes, I do. do. Do you want to live a holy life? Yes, I do. You know what that reveals? Grace. Because that would not have been your answer before God saved you. Would not have been my answer. Do you want to obey God? It's like my children. No. <laughs> don't you want to come over here? No. I don't want to do that. We all do that. We can see, we can see it in ourselves and in, in children, in our own heart. But in our, in our heart, there is a new life that has been created by God so that we can genuinely say, yes, I'm not perfect. I'm not who I want to be. But yes, I do want to please you. I want to reveal what grace has done. So even your obedience comes from setting your heart on grace, the kind of grace that transforms. Set your heart on grace, and as you do that, remember, this grace made me new. Set your heart on that grace. At the beginning of the day, let me give you some categories again. At the beginning of the day, set your heart on the kind of grace that makes people new. The kind of grace that makes people new. The kind of grace that transforms, that is a workmanship kind of grace. Set your heart on that grace. So that what you're going to do today is going to be revealing grace. I want to reveal grace today in my parenting, in my work, in my interactions with my coworkers, in my thinking about my money and my stewardship of my time. I want to reveal the grace of God that's made me new. I want to reveal it today. Do this also in moments of temptation. Don't spend all your moments facing temptation thinking about how hard the temptation is. Spend some moments reminding yourself that you were made to reveal the power of grace. Last application category in the evening. Let me encourage this. I was thinking about this for myself as I'm thinking about this message. In the evenings... What does it mean to reveal grace in the evenings? It means looking back and noting that God was at work in your heart today. I I read a a book draft recently of a, a good pastor friend, and he made this very insightful point that I thought, that is such a good point. He said, Christians rarely look at their life and celebrate how God is at work in their hearts. They might do that towards others, but they don't often do that towards their own life. This is not about bragging. Remember, this is just revealing grace. I was a nothing, and God made me a something, and now that something is doing what God designed it to do, so the credit goes to God. But one way we reveal grace is by looking back and saying, you know what? It was not a perfect day, but Lord, you were at work enabling me to be patient. I I was more patient patient today than I was yesterday, or I, I didn't totally blow it in that one test. I, I, I did pray in that moment. I, I read this little bit of scripture. Yeah, it wasn't like the full chapter, and I don't have it all memorized yet, but I, I did that, and since the starting point was nothing and negative, anything that reveals grace should be celebrated for the glory of God. So at the end of your day, let me encourage you to look back. Where was grace evident today? Where did I give evidence that I am the workmanship of the Lord? Because I would not have done that on my own. Just review that as you're drifting off to sleep. Your grace was at work there. It was at work there. Lord, I see how your grace is at work there. John Newton said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world, but still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Resting in grace and revealing grace. That's the natural state of the Christian. That's what it means to set our heart on grace, according to Paul. What what does it look like? It means resting in grace. Remember, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. 
Your faith set on the finished work of Jesus Christ who paid for all of your sins without exception. Didn't miss a single one. Absorbed them all so that now the favor of God towards you is without cost, without price, without limit, without decrease. And everything I do in my actions is for good works, which don't go to my credit, but they reveal the craftsmanship of the master builder who can build hearts who used to be dead and now walk out godliness as a testimony to the grace of God who saved them and changed them for his glory alone. So that we rest and we reveal and we set our heart on grace and we are vigilant against that drift that happens. We want to look to ourselves. We look away from grace when we trust in ourselves and when we sin against God. And in both occasions, we need to set our heart on grace again so that we rest and we reveal. Set your heart on grace from start to finish. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, set your heart on grace first. Don't get into your day with your clock set to the wrong time. Set your heart on grace first, from start to finish. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in your grace. We affirm the sufficiency of your grace. We reject all boasting in our accomplishments or righteousness or avoidance of temptation, and we boast in your grace. Lord, I, I pray for a very particular impact of this chapter of Ephesians and, and chapter 1 as, as we come to a, a, a transition point in Ephesians, I pray for an increase in joy in our church. Well, this is a joyful couple of chapters here. I pray for an increase in joy. I pray, Lord, that fathers and mothers and singles and youth and children, Lord, friends would be joyful, joyful when facing suffering, joyful when, when giving into temptation and then realizing in conviction that we need to change, that there would be a joy in the forgiveness of grace. Lord, I pray there would be a, a joy that is unassailable in our church because of these marvelous passages, that we've been blessed in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that we have been adopted, that we've been given an inheritance, that once we were dead, we've been made alive, and that grace has saved us, not our own works, and that now we've been set into a new life in Christ. I pray that the truth of these passages would fill our church with joy for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.